let me tell you, I'm very happy uh, to be here and have the opportunity to share with you the research that I'm doing. Uh, it's always nice. Uh, so when Angelina asked me to do it, uh, I was very glad to be able to do it. But also I was kind of a little bit concerned about what exactly should I be talking about and what could be interesting to do here. And so I went to her and asked her, and she told me, you know, say something about your research and what you're doing. So here we are. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, I, I put some slides together from different presentations that I had, so that's why it will be different in format. And the first time I tried this, I realized that if I'm just going to go on my project uh, from the start, you know, materials and methods, and here's what we have done, here's what we will do, it, it was deadly. Uh, for you to listen. So I shuffle things around and I will give a little bit perspective and just bring bits and pieces of what I've been doing and what I've done recently to illustrate that. So those are the three foods that I've been working on in the lab. Uh, tomatoes, broccoli was the topic of my master's research in Italy and then something after that and then wild blueberries for the Caribou project and what I'm currently uh, you know working on here. And those are kind of the research interests of, of, of my research topics. The role of diet and nutrition in preventing chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, neurodegenerative disease. And if you think about it, even if you tend to treat them separately, but most of the mechanisms that make a food good to prevent one, it also makes it good to prevent all the other, like antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect. And then while doing this research, I kind of had the opportunity to focus on these two very interesting aspects of nutrition. The first one is the interaction between our diet and our genes and how all this is related to our health. And the other is the interaction between our diet and our gut uh, microbiota, so the bacteria in our gut, and again how all this relates to, to our health. So these two aspects are very interesting because is what tells us that the, the, the same food doesn't necessarily do the same things in all of us because it depends on how it interacts first with our gut microbiota and then with our genes and of course both our gut bacteria and our genes uh, our genetic makeup is unique so the, the branch of nutrition that in, investigates the relationship between diet and genes is nutrigenomics uh, which I try to summarize in this little scheme here this just tells that traditional approach, diet can directly affect health, and I think I don't need to make the point, all of us here know that what we eat can prevent or increase risk of disease, and so the individual on his part can make choices as to what he eats. But we also know that many times nutrients, they affect our health by influencing the expression or regulating the expression of genes in, in our body. And so, for example, you know, think most of nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin D, it, can increase or decrease the expression of about 50 different genes. In it. Um, but on the other hand, because our genetic makeup is not uh, the same for all of us, different genes can have slightly different forms, which we call polymorphisms in different people, which is what determines that the same food interacting with genes that are different will then have different effects in different individuals. You can think, for example, uh, when we say that... Uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids will increase your HDL cholesterol, but this really happens only in most of the population that has a specific polymorphism of the gene that does apolipoprotein A. But 10% of the population doesn't have this form, and so for them, they can have as many polyunsaturated fat they want. It will never affect their uh, HDL cholesterol. And so a genetic factor contribute together with the environment to determine health and if we know how this happens we can kind of use diet which is an environmental factor if you think about it to balance our genetic you know uh, situation we may be genetically more at risk for say colon cancer but then we can compensate with diet and now doing what you need to do to prevent colon cancer like eating less red meat and so on becomes very important compared to the rest of the population because you are specifically at risk for colon cancer and so, if individuals know their genetic profile, they can then adjust their diet accordingly uh, in this way, which is a fascinating perspective, which we call personalized nutrition. Uh, and today, however, we still do not know enough about these polymorphisms to give uh, practical uh, 
recommendation personalized to people. Although there are some, um, and I don't know about here, but definitely in Italy there are many companies that uh, you go to the nutritionist, it will take your saliva swabs and your DNA to the company that will run through the polymorphins for about 100 genes and then give you the response saying, you know, you, you carry these polymorphins for this and this for that, so you should eat this way. And, but the problem with that is for each polymorphism that we know, there's probably a hundred that we still do not know, so it doesn't really make any sense, except that it's fancy for the nutritionist that you, know, so you say, <laughs> you're in good hands, you, you know your genetic profile, and the client says, good is, must be wise, because the other one just told me to eat less and exercise more. But as, as far as research go, uh, what we study is this direction, so how diet influences gene expression, which is nutrition transcriptomics, and on the other hand, how uh, genetic polymorphism determine different effects of the same uh, nutrients, which is nutrigenetics. Uh, example that I want to do at this time involves blueberries, uh, is about nutritional transcriptomics. So just how components in our food interact with gene by increasing or decreasing their expression. And this is actually what we're working on right now upstairs in the lab, Dr. Klimizaka's uh, lab. While blueberries are Again, another important preventive food because they have a lot of fiber, vitamins, a lot of manganese, some sterols, and above all, they are very, very rich in phenolics. They have a lot of anthocyanins. They're one of the two fruits with more anthocyanins together with cranberries. And uh, the reason we are studying them in our lab is mostly related with the metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is this risk condition that you have that can derive from obesity, fat accumulation, and or hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, that will bring a whole uh, set of risk factors, uh, high blood glucose, dyslipidemia, hypertension, pro-inflammatory and prothrombotic state, which will put you at an increased risk for type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. So the metabolic syndrome is not a disease, but it's just a condition that puts you at risk for developing disease. So it's like a, a, a warning sign that says it's now time, everything's starting to go wrong. So worry now because otherwise it will be too late. And we know that blueberry could be good as far as preventing the metabolic syndrome go because we have research in the animal model showing that consumption of wild blueberry is beneficial because they are strongly antioxidant because of all that anthocyanin, they reduce inflammation, they control, help control blood glucose, reduce fat deposition, improve the lipid profile uh, and endothelial function. And so all of this could potentially be beneficial for this state of the metabolic syndrome uh, that then leads to disease. And our hypothesis is that regular consumption of dietary achievable amounts of wild blueberries could both prevent the development of this set of abnormalities to the metabolic syndrome, but also significantly reduce or reverse the progression of the metabolic syndrome to uh, disease, cardiovascular and uh, type 2 diabetes. And of course, uh, it could be proposed as a dietary approach that could be alternative to pharmacotherapy. If you think about treating the metabolic syndrome, which is not a disease, with drugs, it, there's not just one drug, so it's a lot of different things going wrong. So you have to control your blood glucose with one, and then your triglycerides, your cholesterol, and then blood pressure. So you need a lot. And if you can do it with diet, that's better. Mm -hmm. uh, the model that we're using for this is the Obizucurat. Uh, it has uh, striking similarities with uh, how the metabolic syndrome appears and progresses in humans. So it's a good model for studying this condition. And this uh, guy here is from our and a small animal facility. I took the picture myself. It's living over there. Um, so the question, can consumption of dietary achievable amounts of wild blueberries improve lipid profile and inflammatory status in this model of the metabolic syndrome? They, they are genetically altered by themselves. So they, they just, this strain developed to have this genetic alteration so they start having all these abnormalities that there are a lot of inflammation going on and high cholesterol, high triglycerides. Our experimental design, we have our obesity rats, and we also have their lean controls, but uh, we basically divide them into two groups. One group is getting an 8% blueberry diet, and the other group is getting a controlled diet, which is the very same diet, except it doesn't have any blueberry. Uh, we feed them this diet uh, for eight weeks, then we sacrifice them. We take plasma and to do biochemical assays, and we take adipose and liver tissues to do some gene expression studies. We also take their aorta for some functional theory property studies as far as endothelial function go, but I'm not going to talk to you about that today. 
uh, I'm just showing the results we already have as far as our first, our biochemical assays are the question that we asked before. Can this diet improve their lipid profile and their inflammation? And indeed, it did. Um, so the legend here, L stands for lean, so those are the control uh, on the control diet and the control on the blueberry diet. This is the diseased rat, so the obese zucker on the control diet, and this is the obese uh, zucker on the blueberry diet. So you can see there was, that you can see that they have a much higher total cholesterol level, much, much higher than the LT, we could say. But then it decreases uh, in a significant way um, after the blueberry diet for eight weeks. Uh, their HDL cholesterol didn't change much, and so we assume, so we can uh, conclude that that decrease was mostly due to decreasing LDL cholesterol, which is even better. And also their triglycerides, look how dramatically higher they are in the disease rats. And again, it decreases after blueberry consumption. TNF-alpha is a cytokine pro-inflammatory that we have in our bloodstream. Again, they, are, they have a lot of inflammation going on, the obese compared to the lean. And after blueberry, we have decrease in inflammation. This is the circulating level of TNF-alpha in the bloodstream. And the same happens with other similar markers of inflammation. We have a decrease in interleukin-6, which is another pro-inflammatory marker. And C-reactive protein, again, this is an inflammatory protein made by the liver. Uh, it's higher in our obese animals. It decreases a little bit with the blueberries. Adiponectin, which is on the other end, an anti-inflammatory protein, uh, increases after the uh, blueberry diet, which again is good. And you will notice that the obese have already a little bit more because adiponectin is primarily made in the adipose tissue and they have a lot more adipose tissue. So that's why they already have a little bit more to begin with. But then it gets even better with the blueberry. And so now the nutrigenomic question is um, why this happens? Does wild blueberry consumption in some way affect expression of genes? involved in inflammation and lipid metabolism, both in the liver and the abdominal adipose tissues that are two of uh, the most important tissues as far as cytokine production go. This is the model that we started with as for the pathways, uh, how all these different markers are related. Nuclear factor KB is kind of the key of, of it all because uh, it is a transcription factor that is uh, activated by oxidative stress in general, and then it will turn on expression of interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, which then will go into the bloodstream and uh, tell the liver to make more C-reactive protein and then more prostaglandin-2, which is again for inflammatory. They will decrease expression of the adiponectin gene, and so we will have less of these, which is another transcription factor that in turn will not be able to suppress NFKB. So we have this spiral of things going wrong in the direction of more inflammation in general, and one will sustain the other. Now, if we have our wild blueberries, probably the anthocyanin, or maybe just the reduced uh, an oxidation in the environment, we should be able to then turn down NFKB and therefore you know, turn down the expression of all the other in the pathways and increase adiponectin and increase PPAR alpha, which is what we observed. So we went on and we took the adipose tissue and the liver from our animals. We extracted RNA, which is kind of how you see how much of a gene is expressed in the cell in that specific moment. We did our retrotranscription to get DNA, and then we got specific primers to quantify these genes and see the levels of their expression. We did quantitative uh, PCR. Uh, and then we did some calculation to then know the variation, uh, you know, the full variation of expression of these genes following the blueberry diet. And so we saw that indeed, after eating the blueberry diet, the NFKB expression was reduced both in the liver and in the uh, abdominal adipose tissue. That's what AAT stands for, as we uh, imagined. And this happened also a little bit uh, in, the, in the healthy rats as well. So even in the lean individuals, this is just a general effect of wild blueberry consumption or the reduced uh, you know, in, uh, oxidation uh, in the environment. It turns off expression of NFKB. 
and then TNF alpha expression was reduced in the obese, both in the liver and the abdominal uh, adipose tissue. Same went for in leukin six. The scale changes, so some, sometimes these changes look more dramatic than they actually are, but still significant. You can tell. Um, uh, C-reactive protein in the liver decreased a little bit. Adiponectin increased uh, both in the obese and in the uh, lean after. Uh, the blueberry diet, um, we measured that deconnecting only in the adipose tissue because that's where it's expressed. And PPAR alpha indeed also increased, look at it, it especially in the adipose tissue, uh, in both groups. And here we don't really have any difference between the healthy and the metabolic syndrome rat, but it's just the same change in expression after the blueberry consumption. And then we also uh, did a bunch of other, because it's easy, once you have the primers, you keep going and going. Uh, so these are other uh, transcription factors, but uh, I'm not going to tell you about those. This is fatty acid synthase and lipoprotein lipase about lipid metabolism. They all, in a way, change in a way that uh, was uh, in accord with what we saw in the plasma. So uh, the, the decrease in cholesterol and, and triglycerides. And so we could conclude that eight weeks Dietary supplementation with 8% freeze dried wild blueberry powder is highly beneficial to this model of the metabolic syndrome. It improved their lipid profile and inflammation, and also it, favor it favorably affects their expression of genes involved in lipid metabolism and inflammation. And right now, we are doing the same approach on glucose control and GLUT4 and insulin and so on. Um, finally, the third and last example I wanted to bring you today was about the gut microbiota. This is a study uh, that we made in Italy in collaboration with the University of Maine here. Um, we know that there is increasing interest in the relationship between the microorganisms that we have in our gut and the health of the individual. Uh, the composition of our gut microbiota can be significantly influenced by the environment, such as <coughs> antibiotics, but also diet can majorly impact the composition of our gut bacteria. And we also know that bacterial strains from bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are um, the ones that carry out fermentations that are the most health-promoting for all this um, health-promoting effect. And there's some of them here. Some are ones that we always knew, like gut microbiota is involved in metabolizing our bile salts and making some vitamins, some vitamin B, vitamin K, to make um, conjugated linoleic acid from linoleic acid, so metabolism of some compounds. You make your short-chain fatty acids from fiber fermentation, which in turn improves your cholesterol and prevents colon cancer risk. Uh, equal from daizane, that is what's responsible for soy phytoestrogenic activity. We also uh, learn more and more that how your gut microbiota is composed strongly affects immunity, so it can uh, give you more protection against infections. It has some sort of barrier effects, which is the competition mechanisms whereby you can get some pathogens from food probably every day, some salmonella or listeria, but most of the time you won't even realize that because it's just, you know, taken care of by the remaining good bacteria that we have in our gut. And they also have anti-inflammatory effects, so all of which has been linked to preventive cancer and inflammation and cardiovascular disease. And how can diet change this? Well, we know we can have some prebiotic activity, so fiber, fructose, and, and inulin will then promote selection of these good lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. We can have some direct probiotic activity, so if you eat a food that directly contains some live strains of the good bacteria, the streptococci, lactobacilli, bifidobacteria from yogurt, and as long as you find a way to make them through, go through your stomach, then they will be able to... Um, keep growing in your intestine. And on the other hand, if you, as you know, have an excess of animal proteins, then it will promote selection of a bad uh, gut microbiota that does fermentation that are not health-promoting, and that will increase your colon cancer risk. In blueberries, we do have a lot of fiber and uh, polyphenols, um, and also some fructose that could all have a prebiotic activity. So our question is, can consumption of a wild blueberry drink modulate the intestinal microbiota? This was never tested before, and this was part of a bigger project that was done by the University of Milan and Dr. Clemens Zakas here and some other hospitals, the Carpo Foundation, the Wild Blueberry Association. Um, but I'm just going to tell you the part of 
gut microbiota. This was a human intervention. We had 20 individuals. They had this blueberry drink for six weeks every day. Then a washout and a placebo, and then the other group would do the opposite. Same uh, design that I showed before for the broccoli. We would draw blood at the beginning and at the end. Our blood and uh, also our feces, which is actually their feces, which is actually what's relevant to the gut microbiota experiment. They were male, healthy, in that they didn't have to have any disease, but they had to have some risk factors, no, and they didn't have to be doing anything weird, supplement drug medication, antibiotics, of course, no pre- or probiotic supplements. Um, we wanted them with a little bit of risk factor for cardiovascular disease, so one of these elements had to, to be present, but we do, didn't want them to be diseased, so no actual hypertension or obesity or uh, high cholesterol, because then they would likely be taking some sort of medication. We screened them for dietary habits, and then make sure they would kind of have the same, because we don't standardize the diet, we want to have a real-life situation, but we want them to eat kind of uniform, normal, average diet. And so they couldn't be vegetarian, vegan, or on a weight loss diet, or have a very weird high or low consumption of fruit and vegetable. And of course, they had to like blueberries. Mm -hmm. So we took 25 milligrams of freeze dried blueberry powder in water to make this drink, which is equivalent to about one cup of fresh blueberries per day. Um, well, depends on how you consider the one to two cups, should we say. And 375 milligrams of anthocyanin. You can see there's some fiber, insoluble and soluble, and some sugar, both glucose and fructose. No, it was not added sugar, it's just the one that comes from blueberries. And the placebo group had the just water with blueberry flavor and color, and we put in the same amount of sugar in glucose and fructose, so it was just the same except it didn't have blueberry. So no anthocyanin and no fiber and no vitamin and mineral. Uh, they had to maintain their dietary habits, couldn't eat, of course, any other berries. And this is just to show that from those individuals, we did a lot of different biomarkers. Again, oxidative stress and gut microbiota, which is what I'm showing today, and the function, and then their lipid profile and infl inflammatory profile. But this is the project that I was working on specifically. So um, we did qPCR again, so same procedure, but this time we are not evaluating in gene expression. It was just the DNA from their feces to see what is the composition in uh, microorganisms that were there. And so we targeted them with primers. We went to look for these, total bacteria, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, prebotella, clostridium, bacteroides, and rococcus, some of them also negative to make sure that our, you know, blueberry drink didn't actually increase some clostridium, for example, which wouldn't have been necessarily good. We normalized with a total amount of... Um, bacteria, and then we see how it all changed after blueberry, because now we have the before and the after. And here's what happened. Um, you can see that bifidobacterium more than doubled after uh, drinking for six weeks that blueberry drink, which was the most interesting uh, result. And it was also never done before, I mean, this kind of experience. It was really interesting uh, to see how this actually happened. And lactobacillus also increased six times, but it also increased with the placebo. So we assumed that that was not due to the blueberry, but to the fructose likely. L lactobacillus like fructose and sugar, and this was present in the same amount in both, so that's likely the reason why we had an increase in lactobacillus. But what's really characteristic of blueberries was the bifidobacterium, uh, which is one of, uh, if, if you think microbiologists will always say, it's one of the most complicated to change, because they're really picky, they want a very specific environment, they never grow, even if you take your yogurt, but it, indeed it happened with blueberries. And I, it was also very nice to see that, because this was the first time it was done, but now uh, Alison Lacombe here has done another experiment with rats, this time eating blueberries and investigating, with a different approach, but again investigating the gut microbiota, and also she found the same thing, the only group that changed after the blueberry consumption in the rats as well was bifidobacteria, so it's really the wild blueberries. Uh, and um, yeah, so this was just published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry, interesting results, happy that it's out. And um, that's all I wanted to talk to you about, so thank you for your attention, and if you want to uh, ask or discuss something, that will be good. Eat the berries. Yes, eat your berries, if that's the take-home <laughs> message for today. <laughs> thank you.